All right, so let's talk about kind of early in the American Revolution. We've kind of, we've talked about some of these things already, uh, Lexington and Concord and uh, Bunker Hill to a certain extent, but uh, there's some other key details about the early in the American Revolution that we need to talk about. So we're talking 1775, 1776 time period. So the first fighting in Lexington and Concord is in April of 1775. So everything is basically after that point because that's our starting point. Those are the earliest battles of the revolution. Um, although they're not major battles, they are still the earliest battles of the revolution. Uh, so a few things to make sure you're kind of listening for and paying attention to um, is what power and, and what important power did Congress not have? That is the, the Second Continental Congress. What did they not have during the American Revolution? Um, and then what did the Americans gain from the capture of Fort Ticonderoga? So Fort Ticonderoga is a British fort. What did the Americans gain when they capture that? And then finally, what is the significance of Bunker Hill? So make sure you're paying attention to those things, especially close during this, uh, these notes real quick. Um, so the Second Continental Congress, they have, oh, that's weird. So they have, um, they started meeting after Lexington and Concord happens, happened, and they begin operating as the national government. And they direct the war effort as well as other duties. And so these are people, the Second Continental Congress has people that have been elected from each um, colony and they're going to start referring to themselves as states soon but they're not doing that quite yet uh, and so they are kind of the acting government um, for the war effort and for the colonies although certainly each individual colony still has a government as well uh, so you can see kind of that long list of different things that they can do uh, you've got the notes you've got that on the notes I'm not going to read all of that but those, that's kind of the things they can do but what's not on the list is, is probably the most important. And Congress has no authority to levy taxes or to raise a tax or to make a tax. Um, they can request money. They can request supplies. But they don't actually have the authority to, like, enforce any kind of tax. And so this is going to be a big problem for them during the revolution because to fight a war, you need money. And so without the power to tax, um, they're going to have a great difficulty throughout the war um, to be able to provide um, for the army and just for the different needs of the, the, the colonies and that what will become the United States um, to, to fight this war and to wage this war. Um, and so kind of as it says there, individual states, so they may be, and they would basically do this based, uh, they would levy taxes, although they couldn't levy the tax, they would say, okay, you, each colony um, needs to pay a certain portion of this money. So let's say for the next six months, they think they're going to need a million dollars to fight the war. Well, then the largest colony that, let's say they're 30% of the population, they need to pay 30% of that million dollars, so they pay $300,000. And then another colony is about 20% of the population, so they should pay 20% of that million dollars. And so they basically break it down based on your the size of your colony. If the bigger your colony, the bigger portion it was up to it was you that you had to pay. Uh, and the way this and the way they would work it out is so they say this is what you should pay. It's now up to your colony, your um, state's legislative branch, to decide how they're going to come up with that tax. And the fact is that most of them just didn't because they didn't have to. They couldn't be forced to do that by the Continental Congress. Uh, another big thing in the Continental Congress is the debate of the Olive Branch Petition. So the Olive Branch Petition is kind of the last ditch effort to keep peace with Great Britain. So it's fiercely debated in the Second Continental Congress. Um, they end up voting in favor of it. They send this Olive Branch Petition, um, and it does two things. It says, Dear King George, we are still loyal to you, but you must repeal the Intolerable Acts. King George refuses to read it and accuses the colonists of trying to start a war for independence. So he, he, those that were opposed to dissenting the Olive Branch petition, kind of showed that they were right. It was it was worth it was worth a waste of time. 
but of course it doesn't really hurt anything to try it either. And so um, when he sends this back uh, or, and, and says that the colonists are trying to fight a war for independence, uh, it kind of just proves that the, there's going to have to be a fight. Uh, oh, and then he, he, he not just says, hey, uh, y'all are trying to start a war, but he sends 20,000 more troops to the colonies. So Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, so Fort Ticonderoga is, is kind of very far northern parts of um, a, a very far northern area of, of the colonies up there around uh, New York, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, right, way up in that area. And um, there, it was a powerful, it's a good fort, and there's a small British force there. They're not under, they, they don't have any reason to think they're under about to be under attack or anything. But Ethan Allen, who uh, becomes an important general in this war, um, and his uh, band of what are known as the Green Mountain Boys surprise attack the British there at Fort Ticonderoga. Um, uh, Benedict Arnold is um, among them. Uh, Benedict Arnold at this time is still an American general, uh, or I'm not sure if he's a general at this point yet or not, but he's certainly in the military. He's a, an officer in the American army, and uh, he's involved in this. Uh, and they, uh, as they attack, you know, Ethan Allen uh, it calls out to the commander of the fort and says, come on out, you old rat. And uh, they are able to seize 59 cannons from Fort Ticonderoga. And these cannons are going to be very important uh, in the next few uh, months, you'll see. So the British soldiers... Um, that were run off from Lexington and Concord, um, they go back to Boston and occupy the city of Boston. And uh, so, but they're kind of surrounded. The 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 militia that they fought at Lexington and Concord has grown and is basically surrounding the city uh, and takes up on these two hills outside of the city where they can get basically look down upon the city and upon the the harbor, and um, so from these positions, they could they could fire on the British more easily, and so um, the the British are like, well, no, you can't do that, and so they attack three times. Um, the first time they have to you know they have to retreat back down the hill. Um, this is Breed's Hill where most of this fighting is happening. Uh, they attack up a second time, and they have to retreat back. Lots of losses. They attack up that third time, and the Americans are out of. Uh, um, not weapons, but ammunition, and so um, the Americans are run into run into retreat, and the British take the hill. Um, it's the first major battle of the war, and it showed that the Americans could fight with the British. Um, the British are, are certainly more well trained; they have more supplies, they have all the advantages. But even um, even with all those advantages, uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, you know, the Americans do pretty well, do quite well. So this is still militia, though. This, at that point, is still basically just the militia. Um, Congress is meeting in Philadelphia at this time, and they basically just create a Continental Army out of the militia units that are around Boston. And they appoint George Washington, who is a congressman in the Continental Congress, as the commanding general of the Continental Army. And Continental Army, what that means is it's our it's our army, but they will not just they don't just have to serve in Massachusetts. Um, usually, a militia basically serves in your state um, or even perhaps just your county or something like that. Um, well, they are now the Continental Army, so they can be taken anywhere across the um, colonies. Now they have to kind of agree to that to, in in theory, uh, but most of them do. Well. So I told you about those cannons that they seized in Fort Ticonderoga. Well, Henry Knox takes uh, some of his men, and they uh, Henry Knox is going to become one of the, the most another important general. Uh, he's going to be a artillery specialist for the, uh, the United the Continental Army, and uh, he basically takes his men and they drag those cannons all the way down from Fort Ticonderoga to the Dorchester Heights, which overlook Boston Harbor. And the British must evacuate the city, and Boston has been freed. And so after nearly a year of fighting, um, you know, it hasn't been constant fighting or anything like that, but 
but after quite a significant amount of time, what do the British have to show for this fighting? They've just been kicked out of Boston. Um, but the question is, where will they go next? And the answer is they'll go to New York, which is a loyalist stronghold. And so that's kind of the end of the uh, early battles of the revolution, some of the early things um, that we had, need to talk about. The next things kind of go okay for the, the colonists at this point, but we will see in the next video that things get much more difficult.